in the past, I may have led some of you to believe that I'm a brain surgeon. I'm not. Well, not officially anyway. Nonetheless, today we're going to attempt brain surgery on the mini lathe. I plan to replace the spindle bearings and see if it makes a difference. Wait, this might be heart surgery, not brain. Oh just dawned on me why they took away my license. Actually, being clever scientists, we're going to change two variables at once, and we'll leave it to the comment section to decide which of the two actually made a difference, if they make any difference at all, assuming this thing is still breathing when we're through with this, of course. In addition to the spindle bearings, we're going to surgically remove the compound. Well, first things first, as every good brain surgeon knows, you start off with a good clean decapitation. I've removed the three jaw chuck, which was on there surprisingly tight. The spindle is effectively just a tube that goes through the headstock. One end carries the chuck, or your work holding, whatever you like to use. And then somewhere in here in the headstock, depending on the lathe, we've got the motor power that drives this tube, and any gearing that that requires, and the gears that come off that power the rest of the lathe. Now the spindle, or the tube, runs on two or more bearings. The bearings I'd like to try to replace. This is a tapered roller bearing. The lathe, rumor has it, uses ball bearings. And since no respectable lathe would dare go out in public with ball bearings, I thought I'd change them out. It's very likely that the ball bearings in the spindle has something to do with the chatter we were seeing in the cuts in the first video. This, I'm hoping, is a very simple and inexpensive upgrade. Or it could be anyway. It depends on the quality of bearings that you buy. You can get these on Amazon for less than 10 bucks each. I believe it needs two. And even if you get the low quality tapered roller bearings, I'm gonna go out on the limb and say they're probably worlds better than the ball bearings that are in there, but we'll see. Once you take all the bling off, this is about how much lathe is left. The bed is about three inches square, more or less 80 millimeters by 80 millimeters. For reference, this is just the tailstock from my Colchester student. Granted, my bigger lathe is older than my grandpa, but it only cost me about 800 bucks, and some guy who I thought was my friend charged me 150 to move it. I got all the clap trap off the back here. Once you get the gears off, it was really only two, maybe three screws. And in order to separate the headstock from the bed, there are four socket head cap screws. I can't get to those without removing the motor. It looks like there are two jack screws coming up out of the bottom of the bed that push down on the motor, creating tension on the belt. And there are two studs that come through the front with a couple of nuts that actually mount the motor. So if you have too much or too little tension on the belt, or the belt isn't tracking properly, perhaps this is where you might adjust that. All right, there it is. There's the headstock. Came off pretty easy. As I said, it was just four socket head cap screws coming in from under the lathe bed. Unscrew those and it comes right off. Or you can do what I did and just use a really big pry bar and just rip the whole headstock off the top of the lathe bed. That way you don't mix up or lose the screws. Now my particular variant does not have the high low speed selector. There's no additional gearing in here. Yours might have an additional shaft that you'll have to unscrew and push out one side maybe to get the gears out of there in order to get to the spindle down there at the bottom. Again, just for kicks and comparisons, there it is up against the headstock of the Colchester. And this Colchester, as far as quote unquote real lathes go, is actually quite small. I'm doing this with an adjustable spanner in the vise just to keep everything from spinning. If you don't have one of these, don't sweat it. Once you get over the shame, you can just use a punch or a, I don't know, giant channel locks. Just be careful you don't mangle everything up too bad. This blue ring is a bearing retainer, like a bearing cap. There's one on each side. Be sure to remove them or at least take out the screws if you wanna start banging on this thing to get it apart. I happen to be using a press to push the spindle out of the headstock. You certainly don't need a press to do this. You could do this like an animal and just use a dead blow hammer or some wooden blocks, but it's a lot less effort to break stuff with a hydraulic press, so I'm going with this. And there it is. That actually came apart without too much work. I'm left with just the headstock casting. That's the front spindle bearing seat and the rear spindle bearing seat. This bearing came out with the spindle and this little plastic bearing cap. And there's the rear spindle bearing, the gears, and the locking nuts. Again, these were just right in here. The point of all of this is to replace these ball bearings with these taper roller bearings. Ball bearings and tapered roller bearings effectively do the same thing. They roll and they bear at the same time. So why are we changing these out? Well, you can get bearings in all sorts of tolerances and classifications. So the lines do get blurry sometimes. But generally speaking, ball bearings are used where you need speed or maybe low cost, but not necessarily a ton of axial load. Axial load being load in the direction of the axle, the axis. So if you use a ball bearing like a wheel, 
wheel, all of the load is straight down to the ground. And that's great, they love that. But as soon as this bearing starts to steer, for argument's sake, and your car still wants to go straight, well now you have a load pushing that way, sort of in the direction of the wheel axis. And ball bearings don't particularly enjoy that. Tapered roller bearings shouldn't be run as fast, but they take way more axial load than equivalent ball bearings. Ball bearings can take some axial load, as demonstrated by the fact that the ball bearing didn't just instantly fall apart under its own weight. Now compare that to a tapered roller bearing. Compare that to a tapered roller bearing, where the mating faces are conical or tapered. Well, perhaps you can imagine just how much force this would require to push that through to the other side. One last thing before we install these, the factory bearing, the ball roller bearing is a little bit thinner than the tapered roller bearing. This is 16 millimeters. This I believe is 17 and a half. So one and a half millimeters are about 60 thou thicker. Since we're using two of them, that's an additional three millimeters, an additional eighth of an inch basically in our spindle stack up. I'm not sure if that's going to be a problem yet with this lathe. I mean that additional space doesn't go all on one side. That's an additional one and a half millimeters on the chuck side, an additional one and a half on the gear train side. But if there's a problem, I may just grind off that additional space off the back of either this gear or this plastic spacer. I don't think it's an issue for the belt just because it's got a lot of extra space on there, but it may be a problem for the change gears. If this doesn't line up with the rest of the gear train, you won't get as much engagement on the face of this gear. So I would thin out this plastic spacer. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So the next step will just be to push this outer tapered race into the headstock. Once that's in, I'll do the same thing with the other bearing on the other side. You'll want to be careful, of course, that the taper is pointing the right direction. It's sort of bell-mouthed out so you can drop the bearing in. If you push this in backwards, man, I don't even want to think about that. That would be a nightmare to get back out. So just be careful. Bigger side of the taper out. Unless you bought completely sealed bearings, open bearings like this will require some type of lubrication. For a spindle application like we're talking about here, I'd prefer to see oil in there. We'll look at the headstock in a minute, but it's not really built for oil. Failing that, I'm using some lithium moly grease. It's probably a little bit heavier than I would have liked, but this is what I've got. I don't want to pack them the way you might pack a wheel bearing. I want to get grease in there to all of the rolling elements, but I don't know, maybe a 40 or 50% fill. Again, ideally this would probably be like a machine oil lubrification, and it'd be nice to maybe drill some oil ports in the back, add some Zerk style oil fittings, and then hit it with a shot of oil every, I don't know, eight or 10 hours of lathe time. The problem with that, as I mentioned, is that this lathe, this headstock, isn't designed for that type of lubrication. If you were to pump these bearings full of oil, well, they'd shed all of it probably in the first 30 seconds, and it would run down in this empty cap and all over your lathe bed. So I think grease will have to do here. Every now and again that likely need to be refreshed. There might be enough space to back away these bearing caps and pack a little bit more grease in there. You know, maybe when your lathe starts making funny noises. But sooner or later, if you go crazy with the grease, you'll have an accumulation down in the bottom, in the cavity of the headstock. Now, I'll be frank, I didn't think this far ahead, but had I realized this lube issue, I may have gone with something like a sealed angular contact bearing. Though for those, you're gonna be spending a little bit more out of the gate. But dealer's choice, go with the cheaper bearings and deal with having to lube this every now and again, or spend more money, get sealed angular contact bearings, button this thing up and don't worry about it again. To help get parts like these together, if you have time, leave them in the freezer overnight to shrink them a bit. You could also heat up the bearing, but in our case, all the grease might run out. If on the other hand you're in a hurry, just set your IR gun to she took the last cup of coffee and shot out the door without putting on another pot. I did take a little bit off the back of this gear, a 60 thou, a millimeter and a half. Now, I don't know if that was strictly necessary, but I figured what the heck. Now, I did this on my other lathe, but 60 thou is not a big deal to take off with a bench grinder or maybe a Dremel tool. You would want to get this as flat and square as possible, by the way. Now, I was very tempted to change this pulley to something a little bit larger. I happen to have this one. It's not exactly the right pitch for this belt, so I'd have to change the pitch and the pulley on the motor. But a larger pulley here would slow down some of this lathe speed. Oh, that's nice. All right, so all of that so far was pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Half hour, 45 minutes worth of work. Let's call it an hour. Now comes the tricky part. Tapered roller bearings, in order to perform correctly, require a very specific amount of preload. You remember how that taper roller bearing just fell apart, opened up because of the mating tapers? Well, here the bearings are installed facing each other. 
or away from each other, depending how you want to look at it. And so how hard you tighten these nuts dictates the fit of those bearings. Like you could tighten this so hard that the spindle just doesn't rotate anymore. There is some magic middle ground between your spindle not turning and your spindle just falling out the front that would result in optimal performance of these bearings. Now, unfortunately, the way this headstock is designed, it's not super easy to set that preload. Not to mention we have a plastic spacer in here and the fit of these threads on that spindle shaft, you know, isn't spectacular. If you tighten these too much, too much preload, your bearings in your headstock will heat up, maybe overheat. You'll lose a bunch of motor power. If they're too loose, well, your spindle will be too loose. You'll have some ed play. You'll get even more chatter than before. And this whole upgrade will have been pointless. If you have the means, I suggest replacing this spacer with a steel spacer. That'll go a long way. And as you saw, the manufacturer wasn't all too concerned with the fit, so you could probably get away with just slicing off a piece of some steel pipe, maybe. Again, try to get it nice and square, or better yet, just see this project through, and when you lay this together, turn a new spacer, and this is easy enough to get to from the back without breaking it as far down as we had to for this upgrade. I mean, after all, you do have a lathe now. now I'm probably going to get some heat for this suggestion, and you'd be totally right. But for your average Joe trying to do this in their garage, I think what I'm about to tell you will get you there. So first of all, tighten this whole pack, tighten this nut, until you know everything is firmly seated. If you didn't push those bearings in far enough, if they're not properly seated, well, all of this is meaningless. So the first thing to do is tighten that nut until you think you've got that whole pack seated. Your spindle probably won't turn. Then back this nut off maybe, I don't know, a quarter of a turn. Lock it with the jam nut. This will likely feel stiff, maybe a little tight. But keep in mind, we just did a new installation and the bearings are freshly packed with grease. So you're feeling some of that too. We'll put this together back on the lathe, put the motor and the belt back on and run it in for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe at low speed maybe 100 RPM. Let it cool down again and then do the same thing maybe at 500 RPM. When you're done and it's cooled down, check the spindle for end play. We're looking for any motion in and out. I mean, hopefully you don't have actual wobble if you do tighten it up a little bit and start all over again. But maybe use a stick of wood or a pry bar to try to pull the spindle in and out with an indicator mounted on one of the two ends. Your spindle should rotate, but you should be measuring very little, if any, end play. Two, three tenths, I'm not sure. Basically, this is a balancing act. You're gonna have to come back here and make adjustments periodically until you find that right preload. Very little to no slop in your spindle without your headstock overheating. If the paint starts to bubble up, crack, and melt, your headstock's running too tight and your spindle bearings have too much preload. We'll run it like this for now, just to keep apples to apples. But the first thing I'll probably do when this video is over is make a steel spacer to replace this plastic one, and then try to reset this preload. Once this has run in, the bearings are seated, the grease is well distributed, I'll be looking for an easy to turn chuck with very little end play. I don't know, this size spindle with that chuck that it came with, I'd expect it to turn, I don't know, gut feel if you just spun it. With none of the gearing or anything engaged on the back, I'd expect it to free spin maybe half a turn, three quarters of a turn. It's all very touchy-feely, but at home in your garage, I think that's all we really got to work with. I got the lathe back together, more or less anyway. I left off all the sheet metal stuff and I don't have any of the gear train in the back. I'll add them in a piece at a time later. At this point, I really just wanna see what the new spindle bearings do, what they sound like, stuff like that. And it does sound a lot better. I let this run in a little bit, could have probably run longer, but I'm anxious to try this thing out. It does have a little vibration on the high end. I think that's the sloppy plastic spacer we saw, probably the weird lock nuts on the spindle, and I'm sure the chuck isn't helping the cause much. But all in all, better than before. As I mentioned earlier, I've gone ahead and removed the compound altogether. In its place, I made a small riser block. I'm not showing the build here because it's literally just a block of metal with four holes in it. Just a spacer to get the tool post up to the right height. This, with any luck, will short circuit any of the slop we had in the compound top slide. All that stuff we had stacked on top of the carriage. It uses the same bolt hole pattern, of course. It's just a center pin and two screws. I did clean this riser up on the surface grinder. That was completely unnecessary. Again, this just needs to be a solid block of the right height. But, you know, I've got a reputation to uphold. Anyway, I can lock it down nice and square and install the tool post. I've machined a step in the riser block just to have something to register the tool post against. I wanted to use this hole, that's what it's for, to lock the rotation of the tool post. But poor planning on my part saw to it that that hole is immediately above the counterboard hole for the mounting screw. So that wouldn't have worked. And I just opted for a shoulder or a step. All right, let's try it out. That's cold rolled steel, just like before. Let me bring you in tighter and we'll see if the new bearings can handle a hundred thou depth of cut.
Okay, I was just funning you. I snuck in some footage from the big little Colchester. But same material, cold rolled steel. I am using an insert because I want to run this fast. I don't have my tack out. We'll be somewhere past mid-scale on the dial. So 1,000, 1,200 RPM. And I'm going to feed this by hand. Again, none of the gears are in the back. That's pretty good. That was a mix of 5, 10, and maybe 12 thou depth of cut. Surface finish is worlds better than before. Not as consistent because I was hand feeding, but I think you get the idea. Let's try pushing it. 15 and 20 thou depth of cut. <laughs> 15 is making some noise. Let me try that again. A little bit faster. I like that. Let's try 20. Tony's pushing it. I mean, it did it. You had to move some material. It's better than 5,000 at a time. You know, I bet this could do it with some sharp high-speed steel and some oil. You'd have to go slower, of course, because it's high-speed steel. So you might have to figure out what your equivalent material removal rate is. You know, meaning if it's worth your time or not. Some aluminum for you just for kicks. Dialed into 25 thou, and that's some WD-40. Well, there's still some rattling coming from God knows where in the lathe, but it's not the spindle or the cross slide. All in all, for 20 bucks and some time, I think we've made a significant improvement. Now, keep in mind when you see close-ups on this channel, they're usually very close up. We're talking making a shy sailor blush kind of close-up. But perhaps from this distance, you can get a better sense of the finish I'm getting now. Anyway, fixes like this start to get to the heart of the matter. These little machines benefit from some TLC right out of the box. Unless you're doing exceedingly light work. Maybe you're making your own Teflon insulators for TIG torches, custom packing peanuts, or you know, those long fancy cigarette holders that say you've really made it in life. But anything more than that, and it's probably worth the time to make a few simple improvements. And of course, tuning these lathes doesn't stop at just new spindle bearings. It's still got plastic gears, maybe not a problem in and of themselves, but more to the point, they are a bit fast for my liking. So slower gears would probably be in order. Of course, a general cleaning and debarring of all parts to check and verify the fits certainly wouldn't hurt. I mean, have a look at how the carriage is held onto this thing. Frankly, that's playing a little bit dirty in my book. Now, all of that is not necessarily good or bad. The point is, it's good to know what you're getting into. If you were hoping to hit the ground running, again, unless you're making small parts and taking it easy, this probably isn't the best place to spend your money. But if you're willing to put in the time, willing to debug the problems and fixing them, if you're willing to take a face plant right into that leading edge of the learning curve, as far as baptisms by fire go, this is maybe a good place to start. By the time you have this running the way a lathe is meant to run, you'll know it's and your limits like the back of your hand. And if you like it, and end up upgrading to something bigger, well, if you live through all the heartache that this thing put you through, you'd probably be a machining superhero. It's like they say, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Unless it's a machine tool that doesn't kill you. I know if you'll be stronger, but you certainly will be less pretty. And on that sunny note, I think that's all I've got for now. End transmission.